Welcome everyone. We are getting ready to have a lively conversation with Johanna Winners and Nicole Sukup. Johanna Winners is a puppeteer and printmaker based in Kansas City, Missouri. She received her MFA from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and has been awarded residencies at the, oh my goodness, uh, wow, the Ebert? Academy of Fine Arts in uh, Warkow, Poland. I am so sorry, I just slaughtered that. Um, <laughs> the Gutenberg Arts Aromont School of Arts and Crafts, Vermont Studio Center, Acre, the Elizabeth Murray Artist Residency in Kyoto. She was the 2018-19 Printmaker Artist in Resident at the Lawrence Arts Center prior to our artistic pursuits, I personally think this is cool. Winners competed in, oh, on an Olympic development cr cross country ski team based in the upper Midwest. Winners recent work has been exhibited and performed nationally, including the Open Eye Figure Theater in Minneapolis, plug projects in Kansas City, Missouri, and she currently teaches at the Kansas City Art Institute. Nicole Sukup joined Mia as a research assistant for the Departments of Contemporary Art and Photography New Media in 2010. In 2007, she was named Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art and the Minnesota Artist Exhibition Project Coordinator. During her time at Mia, Nicole has assisted with numerous exhibitions, including More Real, Art in the Age of Truthiness, The Sports Show, MN, and Sacred. From 2015 to 16, she served as the interim coordinator of MAEP, overseeing 10 exhibitions. Building on her inside, we, we're just gonna say that Nicole did a lot of stuff and she's an incredibly awesome person. <laughs> and we're going to actually have Nicole kick things off as she will be moderating herself and Johanna during the conversation. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you all for being here tonight. I know at least in Minneapolis, it's sunny and gorgeous. Spring has returned in full force despite our little glimpse at summer. And I wanna thank Johanna tonight, this weekend, or this weekend, this evening for being here too. Thank you so much for your time and for gifting us all with this really beautiful, beautiful show. I think it's really poignant and relevant but I've got to ask, how did we get here? Let's, let's talk about your show and let's start with the title. Can you, kind of, I mean, it, I, I will turn it over to you. Okay, awesome. Um, I think, would it make the most sense for me to share my screen? Get some... Yeah, I think we all like images. Okay, one moment while I do the awkward Zoom share. All right, can you all see what I'm seeing? Yep. Okay, great. Um, this is a, a still image from a video that is in the show at Suvac right now. Um, so Nicole asked, how, how did I get here? How did this show, How to Behave, come to be? And I see it as a, a progression in um, some themes that I've been thinking about in a lot of my work in the last four or five years that have to do with um, shame of the aging female body and what does it feel like or look like to live in that body and how how can I talk about that tension between um, wanting to be desired and also detesting objectification um, and what does the fear of becoming obsolete or becoming invisible look like in an aging female body so those are all themes I've been or ideas I've been thinking about that are present in this oh. work, but more um, specifically in this show, I wanted to create kind of a performative condition for this protagonist to be very excited about the possibility of being watched. Um, and that's where this kind of strange ellipsis aperture comes in through the video, um, which I can talk about more at some point. Um, and so she's she's aware of her aloneness, but also very much pretending that she's being watched. Um, so that's that's where that title, "How to Behave," comes from. Um, and 
in terms of where where the language came from, is that something you you're asking about as well? Yeah, I think it, it there's a lot of interesting push pull in your exhibition that combines this video piece, the plaster work, and the prints in the gallery, and a lot of it resonated around exactly what you had mentioned in terms of the aging body, but also control of the body mm -hmm. and a body constrained. And, and that constraint and control and perhaps a rebellion against is also kind of present in the way that you use grammar mm -hmm. and language in your titles. And so, yeah, I, I would love to hear more about why language is an importance to you. Sure. Um... And I have, let's see, I have a slide that shows some, mm -mm -mm. can I escape my full screen? One moment, please. There, I have an example of some, some of the language that exists kind of adjacent to this work. Um, it's not in the show, but it was made kind of as a way to understand the show. So the, the title, How to Behave, and all of the titles of the works in the show are written in this invented phonetic language that I've been playing with for the last couple of years as a way to, to help me understand the logic of the world of these characters or this one particular character. And I've thought of the, the funny phonetic spelling as like a lapse in recognition. So it's at first glance unfamiliar, like you might not think that you can understand it or comprehend it, but then if you look more closely or sound the words out slowly, then you can hear um, hear something com comprehensible. comprehensible. Um, and I think that's similar to the puppets as well. Like a puppet at first glance is um, unhuman-like, but when it starts to move and you start to see its articulation, there's something very familiar in it, in, 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 in its movement. So I'm thinking about the that either or of familiar, unfamiliar. Um, and with the language, I love that it it forces this like clunkiness or a clunky slowed down reading of it. Um, and this particular bit of writing, which is not in the show, I'm still trying to figure out how to put, put like a poetic form into the sculpture and video and performance. But this was written as a way to kind of understand the, the choreographed dance that is one of the videos in the show. So can you speak a little bit more towards your, your performance, the, the th puppetry? I, I mean, we could just talk about it all under the, the rubric of theatricality. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that drew you to theatricality and to performance and to both the stop, push, pull movement, but also that of the viewer? I have related it to my background in athletics, which Allison mentioned in my intro. Um, I trained as a professional cross country skier um, for a few years after college. And I think that that level of performativity within athletics has been something I've related to in um, performing in an art context. But at the same time, like I don't come from a theater background and being in front of an audience is incredibly uncomfortable. And I think that's, that vulnerability is something that kind of appeals to me in a, in a weird way. Um, it's like the more vulnerable I feel, the more I maybe want to, to be in that space. And the puppets and um, costuming and at a lot of my past performance work involved wearing masks. And so those were all sort of forms of protection um, from that, that, I guess, that vulnerability. Um, and in this particular instance with the, the dance and these two puppet rigging figures, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not wearing a mask, I'm more exposed, but there's still, you know, a level of like cloaking because I'm flanked by these two figures and, and there's like a choreographed control happening. Um, yeah, I think I think that chasing vulnerability is something that is somehow I keep doing it even though it makes me very uncomfortable. 
I think you said something really interesting and that is that you didn't, or maybe it's in that you didn't say it. And that is for me, being athletic is incredibly vulnerable mm -hmm. because it's unscripted. There is no, I mean, you, you rehearse, right? And, or for a lack of another word, you practice over and over the fundamentals of a sport, but you, you are left bare on the field. And it's so interesting to me that the, that the masking allows you to practice the theatricality, the, the, the performance or get to something deeper. Is it, is it that the work is less personal, although the questions tie to you personally, or is it more about striving for universality? Because I think there is something quite universal about aging. We all age mm -hmm. and there's quite privilege in that, but. Right. I have thought about it as something that feels some something that I would be embarrassed to talk about. So I mm. use these masking techniques such as costuming or performance um, to, to talk about it in a way that I'm a little bit removed from. But I think acknowledging that it is a universal human experience um, and a privileged human experience would would be helpful to to take some of that embarrassment off of it. So tell us about the work we're looking at. I mean, it's a beautiful photograph. It's a striking photograph. Thanks. Uh, this is just an example of the kind of mask that I would typically wear in a performance up until um, this most recent body of work where I'm intentionally not masking myself. But there's, I think there's other ways of that hiding happening in the, the show at Suvac. But um, this was just sort of a, a kind of a work in progress. It's not a still from a video or a performance. It was just a day driving out into the prairie in Kansas and taking some... some oh, take your... Pardon me? Oh, never mind. Oh, I think, yeah, I think we got a, a glimpse of somebody being off mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah. yeah. Um, what else can I tell you about it? She she's shown up a lot. I there's still so many things I don't know about her. She doesn't have a spoken language or like a specific name, but she has has been in performance and video and still photo. You know, as you speak about your characters, there's something that reminds me of the way that fiction writers talk about how they deal with their, um, especially fiction writers who deal with serial work mm -hmm. and that they talk about this world that exists beyond them and that the work just captures these like snippets. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, I mean, is that kind of similar for you in that you're creating languages for them and grammar or lexicons and that they imbibe something also external to yourself? Yes, that's a really lovely way of putting it. Because each time I'm making something new, it's it still feels like figuring out, like I refer to it as the logic of whatever that is that's separate from me. Um, and so I can't say if it's all the same character or is it me or is it make-believe um it feels like there's there's still so much i'm trying to answer by making the work and then you know that that leaves me with a lot of questions but that i don't know that questioning just leads to making more work um, yeah that's beautiful i think there's i think especially in art school, students are told that they can't put themselves into the work. That's something I hear a lot from students and even artists who are still trying to learn how to speak about a project or a process. And that putting themselves or talking about themselves isn't the point, it's about the body and the creation. But I think you, where I'm getting at with that and where I'm getting with this is that that kind of keyhole into your process right there, that statement that there's this kind of, I'm gonna paraphrase, lack, there's this mushy space between you, the work, 
the existence of the work in and of itself and you're encountering them and processing these questions is really profound. And I think it, 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 for me as a viewer of your work, where I found resonance is being a woman. I am somebody who identifies as a woman who just had a baby, who's recoming to terms with her body, her body's that's aging. Suddenly things are not where they once were, you know? And suddenly like, people encounter you and in, even people who you've known maybe your entire life reposition around you. There, there's a, a, a reciprocalness that comes with aging that we don't talk about in American society mm -hmm. that I felt really seen by in your work mm -hmm. that I found really profound. But I also found it really interesting in that even though they're masked, even though they're characters in the video, the um, characters are still painting their nails, are still prepping themselves up, are still masking the masking. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about that, about, about the um, performance of gender in your work? Yes, and I'm gonna scroll back to some some other slides that show, pardon the, the hyper scrolling. Um, <laughs> okay, so these like, these viewpoints that show this aperture that I was filming through, um, because I think that's a way to talk about that question that you're asking, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I, I think of this protagonist as, as I, I think I mentioned, she's excited about the possibility of being witnessed and also very aware of the fact that no one's looking at her um, and sort of sort of that seeking validation through being looked at. And the the aperture form was a way for me to think of like her viewpoint of her looking down at her feet as she's shuffling through the woods or painting her toenails, um, eating a bowl of cereal. So something that is through her specific periphery that's kind of a narrowed, viewpoint. And then when the videos were finished, it became apparent that it wasn't just her viewpoint, it's also us um, peering through a portal into her. And um, I, you know, I, it's not like that was this um, planned either or happening, but I, I like that there is, that it can be both. It can be both like us watching her, her watching herself. And that feels very relevant to this cultural moment. I mean, that's how I think of something like Instagram where we project a version of ourselves out into the world and wait for people to notice us and, and receive that kind of validation from people watching us. Um, and so that's, I don't know, an area that I, I want to think more about. Um, and there's moments in the videos where like, for instance, this clip um, when it's when if you go and see the show and the the video is playing the this crease is kind of quivering and you can tell that it's a part of a human body you know it looks like human flesh it's a little ambiguous about what kind of edge or line or border that is um, but it's some sort of opening or closing so I, I think I'm trying not to name anything specifically but point to um, the kind of considerations that this protagonist might have and how they become familiar to, to a person who is like more mortal than the protagonist. And obviously that's all through the lens of like a woman living in a, or a person living in a, a female body um, because that's my experience. Um, so I, I appreciate your, your perception of it as well, especially, you know, as um, a woman and someone who has recently had a kid and how a body is completely transformed through that experience. Thanks. Yeah, I think there's something about the ambiguity, ambiguity that leaves you looking at, and these are really great example of this, that the faces you have to look at the body to, to determine 
a sense of identity um, because the plaster enough, right? I, you know, the faces, they're, they're not recognizable. They're, there's something Jim Henson about them, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, um, they're so far off on the uncanny valley that we kind of recognize them as human, but they're not creepily human. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're something else on, entirely. And, you know, we, we've been talking about that ambiguity, but there's also something incredibly tactile about the whole experience. And I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, and I think for me, the ambiguity becomes familiar through the tactility and mm -hmm. the wanting to touch, the desire to touch, the desire to touch a human body, um, the desire to touch the plaster, the cereal bowl, that kind of, re or even just remembering what a cereal bowl feels like in my own hand as I view the work. And that carries even through to the prints, right? Because printmaking is incredibly tactile. So I'm wondering if you could speak to how important it was for you to retain some of the, the original plaster and, mm -hmm. and how printmaking really fits in with this whole body of work as well. I've thought about my, uh, my training in printmaking, which is kind of where I started after I left a skiing career and started to pursue an art career. Um, the precision of printmaking was very appealing to me. And working in paper mache feels like a complete opposite of, of that kind of precision and technicality of printmaking, which I used to be super attracted to. And now I, I just want lo-fi, really accessible materials such as paper mache that doesn't require specialized equipment and the work can take form more quickly, um, much more quickly than, you know, like a, a beautiful 12 layer lithograph or something like that. And I, I still have so much appreciation and love for the printed form, but I think working with a physical thing in my hand that can take form relatively fast is um, kind of where my, my heart is right now. And, um, uh, what was I going to add about paper mache other than like it's delightfully so lo-fi and and it is a recognizable like kind of sheen and the the hardness and the dryness and the lightness of it you know it's something a lot of us are familiar with and I don't consider I guess up until now I don't consider myself a sculptor I've never really worked much in three dimension um, until I had all these props from these videos that could could behave as standalone sculpture. Um, so it's, I think for me, it came from working with paper mache in particular came from a place of practicality, not having um, sophisticated fabrication skills, but I could make things that felt appropriate to the, the look that I was going for with very accessible materials. I, I think I need to think on that more. Um, no, I think I think you 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 said a few things, and I am wondering if I can just scratch at them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just maintaining the uh, tactility pun, if I can, mom pun it up. Um, I think I want to hear. I would love to hear more about. You, you talk about the accessibility. The ur there seems to be an urgency to create. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong in that? Am I misreading what you said in terms of? creating faster, creating without the nuance of printmaking? I haven't thought about it that way, but I think you're right. Like th there's a desire to just see what it is more quickly. Like I wanna see what the face looks like. And it, as I'm working with it, it, it will tell me what it looks like pretty fast, like in, in one studio session. And then that guides the rest of the work. Um, and maybe it's also responding to periods of in the studio where not much is happening at all. There's kind of a, depending on what time of year it is within the academic year or just languishing in the studio, there might not be much making. And then when you feel that desire to, to make, you want it to hurry up and get there already kind of thing. There's a lot of, I, I also think about this too, like as a former printmaker, 
way back in the day. There's a lot of waiting with and pausing and gentleness that has to occur around printmaking. Mm -hmm. You can't add the next layer until you have all 25 prints run through because mm -hmm. you might write like you, unless you're doing your test prints. And so I think there's something, I, I mean, that, that desire to have something immediate in your hands feels uh, that that feels like a need that I understand because you don't get that necessarily in printmaking. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take a pause right here and just um, invite the audience. If you guys have questions, I would love for you guys to start filling them in in the chat box. And we'll start taking questions in about five to 10 minutes from the audience if you guys have any. But as we build up to that, um, please drop any questions that you might have for Johanna and as we kind of proceed through the conversation about the work, about her practice, about teaching, I, you know, but ideally about the show. So, I, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I can throw up a couple more images from the show. Um, I need like an assistant to be my slide advancer, but anyhow, yeah, here's, here's a close up. <laughs> How did you get into that rig? That's like such a 101 <laughs> question, but yeah. I mean, um, did you have to like crawl up in it? Uh, one of the people in this chat was uh, an assistant one day helping me um, fa get fastened into it. And it, I had loops on my um, costume as well. What was that, a leotard? So the, the rods would get strung through the back puppet and my loop on the shoulder and then the front puppet. So it was kind of one rod at a time and it's definitely not engineered. Like if I were to do this again, I would do some things differently, but um, it's all like a lot of paper mache and epoxy at the, the little connector points. But yeah, it takes about an hour to get in and out each, maybe 45 minutes if things go well. That's, so then do you see, so here's an esoteric question that might bore everybody, but I'm gonna ask it as a curator. Uh, do you see yourself then participating in the character's story or you, um, do you see yourself controlling the narrative or do you see yourself as um, a separate character on entirely than when you perform as you know, in a work like that? I, I think I don't know the answer to that. Like, I think that's why I, Sometimes I'm in the performance or sometimes I'm wearing a mask or like in shadow theater work that I've done, I'm behind a screen. I, I'm kind of balanced or like challenging how I fit in the work, how much control am I willing to release or um, do I want to hang on to? Yeah, I, I think I just, I'm still asking that question. There's no right or wrong answer. You know, I also want to make that clear too, that like, I love that it's nebulous, like mm -hmm. that, that it ebbs and flows and is determined by the work itself. I think there's a beautiful poetry to that. I like, think, sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Um, just in this, for instance, this choreographed piece, it was important to me that I was, you know, human. And these are kind of like two invented friends or, you know, something something like that, like as a, um, a protection against loneliness or something, or like against self-pity. So I didn't want to be wearing a mask in this dance, but there have been performances where I'm wearing a mask and also puppeteering and yeah, I wanna try all of the solutions. I don't think that there's, I mean, I think I am searching for like the right strategy, but if the result is I just keep making more work to try to figure it out, I'm, I'm okay with that. I actually, somebody asked a great question that is so relevant to what you both are saying right now. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw it out there. Yeah. Um, from Seth and uh, he was curious when Nicole mentioned characters uh, earlier on in the discussion he wants to know if 
you, if you see uh, the work as characters or objects or a completely alternative definition to either of those things. Hmm. I do refer to them as characters, though I often am frustrated by what that word implies as if I have a backstory or names or an arc or that they have a history. And I've kind of stopped trying to answer those questions, but character seems like the closest. I guess I've now started to use the word protagonist, which feels less specific or maybe more specific. Um, hmm, I think they can be both performers and objects in one context or in like in one exhibition space. Um, you know, they, they stand as, I mean, these, these are a, a pre-limbed version of them, but they are sculptural objects. And then in front of a camera, they can become performing figures. I hope so that, I wanna build, oh no, go ahead. I was just gonna ramble off on that one. <laughs> no, that will, it's your talk. You get to ramble oh. all you want. <laughs> Um, so I want to build off that question and maybe put a little bit more pressure on that. Okay. A lot of what we're seeing in the show, not a lot, but a, a, a little bit it, are these artifacts from the film and the performance. Mm -hmm. And I would love to know, do you, instead of maybe as objects, do you see them as artifacts, as, as, um, detrius to, mm -hmm. to the work? I thought of them as um, remnants, which I think is related to Detrius. Um, and as, as a new, I feel very new in the realm of presenting objects. And so I don't know what they do yet. I, I think having them in context to the video helps provide maybe another way of understanding what's going on in the video, even if it's just getting to see things up close and see how they're made and see what scale they're at and relate that to your own body. Like these legs are smaller than a human body, but bigger than a doll kind of thing. Um, so that's that's where I'm at thinking about them. Um, and yeah. yeah. No, that, that makes sense and I think um, remnants feels like a really good term for, for a lot of the work. And I, I think John's question is also really poignant here. And so he's asking, does the history and age of puppetry as a popular medium help guide what the work sets across, sets across regarding age in the work at Suvac? Sorry, could you repeat that one more? Yeah, time? so he, he's asking, you know, puppetry has been a medium, particularly in the West for millennia, if not longer, right? And so as a timeless medium and a popular medium, how does, how does puppetry really guide the, the concepts of the show? I think I, I may have touched on this a little bit when talking about this sense of hiding, but I, I'm so drawn to puppetry because it does provide this barrier, I guess, between myself and performative object. Um, and that sense of, I guess, unrecognition slash familiarity at the same time that a puppet is capable of is really appealing to me. Um, like when, when you see a puppet moving, there is something that we recognize as human in it, but it's it's also at the same time decidedly unhuman. And I don't know, I think that's a like an interesting tension to kind of reside in. And I'm not a scholar of puppet history. Like I I, I am kind of making up my own rigging systems. Um, I think there are there are very technically beautiful types of puppet rigging and I 
only know like the basic rod form. Um, so I don't know that I'm I'm that my work is in conversation with the history of puppetry so much as using it, like stealing whatever is useful from it and using it in a fine art context versus a theater context or um, something you know, like a stage performance. But I think there's an interesting in between of those two realms as well. The notion of in between is something that comes up quite a bit in this conversation tonight. Mm -hmm. Do you do you find the liminal spaces of life comforting? The the in between daily mm -hmm. minutia. I think so because then you don't then you don't have to make a hard and fast decision about things. <laughs> you can um, like there's a, a permission to be unsure in that space. So I have one other question and then I'll, I'll really open it up to the floor. Do, did you find a resolve for what aging and the feminine body can do or present to do in this, this work? Do you, did you, do you find solace or did you find solace in your questions that you set out at the beginning of creating mm -hmm. the work? I still feel, I still want to make work about shame and the aging body because I, there's this like anticipation of, of that becoming invisible. Um, and so this, this work feels like bracing against it um, or preparing for it in some weird way. But there's also a joyfulness to it in both in making it and looking at the finished thing and thinking about the kind of wisdom that an aging body has that a youthful body doesn't and the kind of history that it contains and what it is a container for. So it's not, it's not all um, woeful, but I, I don't feel like, okay, I'm, I'm done making work about shame. I will, I will until, I mean, I'm curious what, what my work would look like when I'm 85. I hope I'm still making work then. And I hope it's really fucking weird. <laughs> I do too. Um, <laughs> so I want to go on to qu uh, Tiffany's question. Tiffany is really curious about the bottomless chairs used in the exhibition, the chairs that you created and sh had shown in the previous slide. Do those chairs relate back to the body? I think they do. They are one of those forms that came kind of early when this work was developing. And I liked that they were enough of a chair without having to fully finish the chair with its cushions. And so they sat in my studio, there were three of them. And so they just kind of came along with the work and I they do reference like a, a place of sitting and waiting or um, an absence a lack, and I, 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 you know, I still am wondering what are they doing there, um, but I like them. <laughs> and I, I think they do have like a, the way that they kind of lean and are a little awkward seems to fit with the other awkward objects in the space. You know, I think that's a, a, a beautiful segue into our next question from Leela. And, Puppetry can be horrifying if you grew up watching or forced to watch Chucky, but I think puppetry in and of itself is also joyful and humorous. And the way you talk about your work in particular, you talk about these moments of joy. Can you talk about the use of humor in your work? Mm -hmm. And would it be correct to use or describe specific moments of playfulness in your work? In in this work specifically, I think the the choreographed dance, editing that video made me so delighted. Um, so there, there was definitely, well, okay, let me back up. The work that I made previous to this body of work was a performance um, that was really upsetting. It was really difficult content to, to be with for, for months and it was, you know, months of rehearsal and 
um, performing for a live audience and and making eye contact with the audience in a way that felt like a really big step for me, but really, really difficult. And I, I told myself I wanted to, you know, still be true to the ideas I'm interested in, but have make some room for joy or for humor. And I think that's where this this puppet rigging dance came from. Um, and the the audio and some of the other video pieces, you know, are kind of silly or you know, Allison referenced the the breathing that terrifies her or <laughs> makes her, you know, a little unedgy. Um, so th there was an intentional direction towards, I guess how, it, how I'm saying it is more, more joy while still thinking about things that are harder to talk about out loud. Yeah, I think there can be something quite radical about joy too. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about something that is so stigmatized as the aging feminine body. I mean, what more radical act than could you do than to celebrate it and to celebrate that privilege to grow old? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna ask a question asked by Esther. How do you grapple with the tension between the, pre the precise art form of printmaking and the ambiguous, ambiguous nature I swear I know how to read everybody. Yeah. Um, and the ambiguous nature of puppet making. And how do you see it benefiting you both as an artist and perhaps as an invite of intrigue to your audience? There's so, so much in that question. Um, so how am I balancing like the, the precision and the technicality of printmaking with the kind of crudeness of these paper mache sculptures? I think I was a different person when I was really into printmaking. I was in my mid to late twenties and I entered grad school to study printmaking and get, you know, folk, I, I entered grad school thinking that is all I'm going to, to be, that's all I wanted to be. And I had a pretty sharp pivot. I, I don't wanna like bore you all with the, the history of how I got to puppetry, but um, there was a decided like moment in a critique when a, um, a someone who became a friend of mine said to me about my prints that they were kind of boring. And I was, um, I took it personally in the moment, but I needed to hear that. And that was kind of the shove or like, you know, the, the gentle push I needed to think about how to have more at stake in the work. And I had always wanted to work with puppetry and having um, grown up in Minneapolis, I had seen puppet theater at um, the Open Eye Figure Theater and the Heart of the Beast Theater. And so it just felt like something that I would never, you know, I don't know how to do that. I don't, that seems like you'd need so many years of training, but in grad school, there's a lot of just like permission to, to do something that you don't know how to do and figure it out. Um, so I left that, the, the preciseness of a printmaking aesthetic um, and I, I waved goodbye to it. And I, I still work in print, but I'm now doing more like, I don't edition anything. I just do one-offs. Um, I kind of use the printing press like a drawing tool in a way, or like the mono printing process of um, making iterative imagery. Sometimes it's drawn back into, or there's like collaged elements um, added onto it, but I'm not trying to like, precisely replicate anything which feels appropriate for, for my purposes. And I, I, you know, I still very much admire work that is that precise. Um, I used to, to work at High Point Center for Printmaking Minneapolis. So I got to witness, you know, the, the most technical feats of printmaking wizardry um, from a distance. High Point is a magical, magical place. If we can shout it out to anyone who hasn't been, please make your way over there. So I wanna amplify something that Esther questioned, and that is the audience. What, if the audience only were to take away one or two things from your show, what would you want them to be? Hmm. I would want them to, to have a curiosity about the condition of 
this either singular protagonist or these these two figures who maybe represent one protagonist. Um, I, I think I'm okay with without, I guess, with leaving the, the audience with that sense of curiosity. Um, and you said two things. Okay, so the second thing would be, <laughs> gosh, that's tricky. Maybe I'd want them to, to think about why the, why is there this, um, aperture viewpoint in in the videos and then if you look at the end of the projector which i don't think i have a photo of um there is like an extension that i made for the projector so that the projector also has that aperture so you can't see the edges of the the video file um i want yeah i think the videos to me are like the most exciting part of the work but i i also once I saw all of the sculptural forms up in the, the space, I realized, oh, these are, they hold, they hold weight. Um, so yeah, I want the, the viewer or the audience to, to have some, I guess, a song stuck in their head from the choreographed dance, thinking about the round ellipsis. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it's something beautiful that you said, and that is you want them to be curious about the, the protagonist. And I have to say, as a viewer of your work, I felt like I was entering the stage after a play. Hmm. Like this, like the remnants of the show were there. The playbills were there. There was even a recording of the play, but I couldn't quite fully access that world. And I loved that push pull that desire to touch everything and do all the things that you're not supposed to do with art like right like you're supposed to not walk around and you're not supposed to wonder how do you sit in these chairs you're just supposed to accept that the chair exists mm -hmm. said the museum kid and you know <laughs> and there's something incredibly beautiful that you're offering this world without giving answers and so, Joanna, I really, I really want to say thank you for that, because that is a gift to be given in a day where we expect immediacy every every second we get it or could have it. So, last call. Are there any other questions from the audience? I'm gonna cheat. And yeah, you can cheat. It's not right in the text box because I don't wanna. Um. Fine. <laughs> you do that. Um, I'm going to change the scenery. Okay, sure. And I think I'm building off of both Esther and Nicole's statements because I think um, as we talk about whether these are characters and what kind of personalities they have in the future, are you going to continue to build worlds for them? Because I think there is that ambiguousness to creating characters that the sky's the limit like you can put them in any situation um and activate different parts of their personalities to the way you're feeling or how you want to touch the audience so what is what is in the future what mad things are you going to hatch for us I love the process of working with the choreographer and being directed, like being told what to do. And so that's something in terms of form, I would like to, to think about how to incorporate that into future video. Um, and I loved the, I mean, I think I wanna stick with video for a couple of reasons, like in a practical sense, um, I don't remember if I already, mentioned this, but it, it just happens more quickly because I don't have to um, rehearse for months and have a crew and a, a soundtrack and those kind of things. Um, but then I, I know that I'm gonna miss live performance as well. So can I just like cop out and say more of the same things, but better? <laughs> <laughs> that's always an answer not to answer for Allison but that's always an appropriate answer so we got one other question uh this one is from Seth 
in a conversation with um, Sunura Taylor, Judith, but Judith Butler, Butler quoted um, Deleuze and posits that the real question is not what is a body, but what can a body do? In your work, you know, and within the intersection of aging, femininity, able bodiness, and disability, you know, is there any part of your work that resonates with disability or inability? I haven't used that language to speak about it. I think um, the way that, especially if I'm performing in a mask, there is an intentional kind of shuffling that seems to happen when embodying that character. Um, I don't, you know, I wouldn't say that aging, well, I do think that aged bodies are othered in some ways in our culture and um, that there is a, a sense of diminishing social currency for women after a certain period of their life where they're they're not within you know the child bearing years any longer um and that could just be like internalized shame and misogyny and or i think it actually exists in the world um as like messaging that we are given um so i think the answer is no i have not specifically thought about disability in that term, but I have thought about bodies that are less valued, if that perhaps gets at that, that question. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's valid. I would love to know what you have next on your plate. Do you have any shows coming up this year? Yes, um, I have one in Chicago through a residency um, that I did at, at Acre is the name of the residency and um, it's in Southwest Wisconsin, but it has a connection to Chicago. The date of that is still being determined. And I have another a performance um, show lined up at, you know, I'm not sure I can announce this one yet. Um, it's in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> so we will stay tuned for yeah. through your media channels, both on yeah. Instagram and Facebook and everywhere else, uh, for your forthcoming yet to be publicized performance. Yes. And the upcoming show at Acre. Allison, what is next up for Suvac? Uh, next up at Suvac is Mushin um, Hakim and Pedram Badari. Baldari, excuse me. <laughs> um, and they are going to be uh, having interactive installations uh, throughout the space. Uh, Mushin's is satisfaction not guaranteed, and Pedram's is uh, your games and your games. So. Stay tuned for political engagement at its most brilliant coming soon to Suvac. <laughs> it opens on June 12th. And I believe um, on May 11th, there's a talk with Annika Schneider and Esther Callahan. Yes. Yes. There yes. Is. <laughs> and we'll be, I'm jumping in and like, oh, there's something. Um, yes. And we'll be in the gallery with them for that one. <laughs> So it's a little different format. Well, thank you, Johanna. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you all from SUVAC. This has been a really beautiful moment. And I have to say, after walk, walking through your show, I have never felt more seen. So thank you, thank you. for that gift. Thank you for saying that, Nicole. And I so much appreciate your, your thoughtful questions. And I was taking some notes on... Um, on your pondering. So I really appreciate this, this time. And thanks for all who came and listened to me yammer. And thanks, Nicole, for being a rock star at question asking and moderation. We deeply appreciate that. <laughs>
Well, and thanks, never- Johanna and Allison. I just had to keep it going. Yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm going to go study up on how to become a puppet historian. Well, I want, Johanna, someday I want you to come back and actually perform in the gallery. Uh, yes, please. I really, I mean, we yeah. had thought that was what was going to happen initially, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I might have to road trip to Ohio. <laughs> I can, <laughs> I'll certainly do it. As a secret show <laughs> when I find out about it. Um, yes. Maybe we can bring a group of people, but I want to see your performance now having like, imagined in in the show and looking at everything and yeah yeah we'll we'll take the show on tour and definitely stop through minneapolis (laughs) thank you so much thank you all and thanks for everyone who joined us tonight thanks again good night everyone good night